Welcome to Second Take, the show that takes a look at the issues behind the news. In the week that President Cyril Ramaphosa signed the Climate Change Bill, the Presidential Climate Commission released a report warning that South Africa may not meet its 2030 decarbonisation targets. Terence Kuma joins me to discuss why this is the case. Hi Terence. Hi Chanel. What commitments has South Africa made with regard to decarbonisation and the just energy transition? Yes, back in 2021 at COP26 in Glasgow, South Africa made a far more ambitious nationally determined contribution in NDC, which is our sort of pledge, it's non-binding, to decarbonise our economy. And we, we, we reduced the range uh, to uh, 420 million uh, tonnes of carbon dioxide equivalents to 350 million tonnes carbon dioxide equivalent. So fairly big range still, but it was a, a, a big improvement on what we had pledged earlier uh, under, uh, under our, our previous commitments to, to the United Nations. And we actually are in the process now of revising that NDC uh, and updating it. So that was a, an important milestone because it was a, a sort of a, a global first mover in terms of the just energy transition, making a, a fairly uh, ambitious pledge and that galvanised uh, the developed countries into some sort of action and they made a just energy transition partnership with us uh, and then we got these this, this monetary pledges of $8.5 billion and subsequent to that other countries have either joined that partnership or have entered um, into bilateral with South Africa around our just energy transition investment plan that's raised those pledges to over $11 billion. So it's not enough for what South Africa needs to, to transition, but it's important seed capital um, to nudge us in the right direction and to help us start uh, this decarbonisation journey. In some ways, it was meant to accelerate, but at least keep us on track of that decarbonisation journey. So that's really the commitment we've made to the world. Why is the NDC target for 2030 at potential risk? Well, I think it really comes down to the mismanagement of our electricity transition for many, many decades now, or a couple of decades now. And we really haven't been building at a pace and scale new, reliable electricity, cleaner electricity generation uh, that, that we need as a, as, as a society and as an economy. And that's manifested in very intense load shedding as the aged coal fleet that was poorly maintained uh, sort of started decommissioning itself from the grid. We had uh, very bad uh, power disruptions, which really has been the weight around the South African economy's neck now for a number of number of years, and it was really intense over the previous three years. And we are just emerging, following a serious effort from Eskom, uh, which has been applauded by uh, many stakeholders, but also by business and labour that have come together and really made a national effort to stabilise the coal fleet and to, to you know, let it uh, create some space uh, for bringing in the new, more reliable capacity. But what's put the target at risk is a decision, and I think made really much behind closed doors. Uh, we, there weren't probably proper public hearings. There wasn't the public consultation around it, really but basically to allow Eskom to delay the decommissioning of, of power stations that were supposed to be uh, taken down before 2030. Uh, so um, Hendrina, Camden, uh, Kumbati, we know, did get taken down, but those power stations are now going to be in the mix uh, and they're dirty and they're old and they're going to be in the mix until 2030 at least. So now that has to be re, re put back into the base. So we had a uh, integrated resource plan which showed a decommissioning schedule for a lot of these power stations and those are now not going to be taken off as, as scheduled. So when we now do our new NDC, we'll have to see what impact that has and Eskom in getting its, uh, minimum, uh, getting its appeal granted against having to apply a minimum e emission standards so it hasn't been operating within the legal boundaries of our air pollution limits. And they've got a, now permission to continue doing that for these power stations, fire power stations, 
until 2030. And they're going to be applying for a number of other power stations that are operational till 2035 to also continue not meeting minimum emission standards. And the argument there is, if we do, we have to bring off about 16,000 megawatts of capacity. I mean, we don't have replacement capacity. The lights will just stay off. And if we were to meet minimum emission standards, we have to spend 300 billion at least, which we don't have. So that's the argument. And in this very opaque process, they've got permission to go ahead. And I mean, society wants the lights on, so there hasn't been massive pushback against that. So if we put that back in the base, what is it going to mean? Um, so we're going to have to see now whether we can meet that range of what I said, 420 to 350 range. If we're above that range, it's going to be quite problematic for South Africa. What could it mean for South Africa? Well, I think it's going to mean, you know, this money that's been made available and the additional pledges. You know, there's going to be some reticence in giving South Africa um, that money and pushing it through. Some of it has already flown mostly in the form of policy loans. So it goes into the big treasury pot. It's not directly project related. And I think that has meant that it's almost invisible. So what is this just energy transition? People are asking, uh, where are the projects? Well, mostly that money's gone into the treasury to help lower our overall cost of debt financing. So it's been beneficial already to South Africa, even though it's fairly invisible. We're now into a stage where people want to see real projects at the power stations, helping coal affect uh, coal linked communities, workers and the communities that are losing their jobs as a result of closures. So we're going to have to go into that phase. Now, if we aren't meeting our climate commitments, is the money going to flow as, as cleanly as it has under the policy lines? And that's already a question. Uh, and so we'll have to see, you know, we've made a commitment that has sort of stimulated a cash flow into the South African economy, cheap money. Um, but if we can't honor that commitment, will that money really flow? And if we can't honor that commitment by 2030, do we have to pay it back? I mean, that's unlikely, but uh, you know, that could be, you know, some of the international partners will say, you know, you haven't met your climate commitments and you might have to pay it back. But I think more the problematic is it raises the cost of the energy transition if we don't get this cheaper money. And really, there's a lot of grumbling about the amount of loans versus grants. I mean, I don't think we're going to see more grants if we can't uh, if we can't meet our commitments or if there's any signal that we're going to be breaching that. But so it's going to be about getting cheap loans, and those cheap loans are important for South Africa, and uh, to make this transition less expensive for the economy as a whole. Could the new climate legislation assist in helping to close that potential gap? I think it could. One, it institutionalizes something like the presidential climate commission. So there's this independent advisory voice that is making this warning that's going to be a bit more muscular. And I think the second thing is, is about joined up government, you know, so that climate commitments get integrated at all levels of government. I think that's really the, the beauty of the legislation. So that every department, whether you had a local government, whether you had a provincial government, or whether you had national government, and and also then business and, and you know the rest of society, everyone has to start integrating these uh, ad adaptation, which uh, is a, is, a, is really different from what I'm talking about here, which is really lowering our carbon emissions, which is mitigation. So really integrating adaptation, so the way you build infrastructure, is it climate resilient? Is it going to withstand droughts and floods? Because really this climate change is really mediated through water. So either it's floods or too much water or too little water. So, you know, so are we going to be able to do that adaptation? And there the grant money, I think, is going to be very important in some cases. And then um, are we going to mitigate at the pace that we've made commitments to. And because we have this overarching legislation, it should at least be one of the issues that you have to integrate into your planning and into your budgets. So I think it could be an important lever to help us ensure that we meet our 2030 commitments and then our big aspiration of being net zero by 2050. Thank you. That's the second tech show for this week. 
Thank you for watching and join us again next time for more news analysis. Also, don't forget to listen to the audio version of our engineering news daily email newsletter.